Welcome to Metro Focus. In this episode, we're hanging out in historic Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. We'll visit some local spots that are sure to attract tourists and native Washingtonians. We'll head over to a specialty shop dedicated to the sewing community. We'll enjoy some tasty desserts without all the guilt. And we'll visit a historic landmark that's been in the area since the 1700s. We'll also check out an art center that's doing some amazing and inspiring things in its community. And of course, we'll do all this by bus or rail. We'll discuss all things going on with Metro's Safe Track plan for the next upcoming months and what that means for your commute. So sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy this Metro Focus ride. I'm Eric Wallner, I'm the CEO of the Torpedo Factory Art Center. The Torpedo Factory Arts Center houses 165 artists in 82 studios, seven galleries. We have the Art League School, a cafe, and a gift store. Our mission is about presenting art in person and in progress. So the idea is that you can go into any studio you want, you can engage with the artists, you can ask questions, you can learn about their technique. We offer art in all different disciplines, from ceramics to sculpture to painting. Uh, we have jewelers. And that's kind of the beauty of, of the space, is we're the largest collection of publicly accessible artist studios in the United States. All the artists are juried in. There's an independent jury of arts professionals that review the applications once a year, and they select artists that uh, then get on a wait list to get studios here. We are built in a former military facility. Between World War I and World War II, we did make torpedoes and in 1974, the city of Alexandria purchased the building and a group of artists came and asked if they could use it for studio space and that became the birth of our organization. When the Torpedo Factory Art Center was founded in 1974, it was basically abandoned. There were pigeons living in the building, it was a mess. And the artists came in and renovated it and made it a really interesting, vibrant tourist attraction and created the business and the tourist destination that it's become today. There was nothing down here when it first started. Because of the presence of the art center, the area became the historic and cultural center of Alexandria. We do offer a, a wide variety of public programs, most of which are free. Admission to the building is free. Um, we have a Second Thursday Art Night, where you can come and attend exhibitions, we usually have live music, refreshments, there's a, usually a hands-on craft activity of some kind, different things for, for people of all ages to do and engage in. Torpedo Factory Art Center gets about a half a million visitors a year, and most of them come through public transportation. We're very, very easy to get to. You can take the metro to King Street Station. The Torpedo Factory is actually one of the earliest examples of urban creative reuse of an industrial building. We have become the model for many art centers all over the country and we're very proud of that. We have really been a center of creative placemaking for the city of Alexandria. Being on the Alexandria waterfront, there's access to all kinds of other recreational opportunities. The visitors always get such an incredible sense of joy and discovery and to see a, a, a child in particular engage with an artist and, and spark their creative imagination is, is really exciting. My name is Whitney Steiger and my jewelry line is UDOP based here in the Torpedo Factory Art Center. It's one of the only kind of artist havens here in the D.C. area where you can actually have a working space where you can also have public come in and see and purchase things, which is huge. Uh, I've just seen the great exposure that you get uh, from being in the building and having those kinds of opportunities because you never know who you're going to run into here. It might be their first time seeing any kind of artwork to people who are collectors. It's kind of a great opportunity for that. I get my inspiration from uh, a lot of sketching, uh, going to other art exhibits, seeing different textiles, all those kinds of things. And a lot of it are mark makings that I've done over and over again. You know, if you've ever been on the phone or in a meeting uh, and you kind of start doing those drawings, I use those kind of patterns and I save them uh, or I'll take a picture of them and then I'll incorporate them into like my rough sketches that I'll use for my carvings and my pieces. I have two older sisters and a mom and so when they started you know taking things that I'd made for myself 
uh, and giving them to friends and different things, you know, I kind of knuckled down and started making my own stuff. One of my most favorite parts about being in the Torpedo Factory Art Center is that I get to explain my process. It's a little different, especially with my cuttlefish casting because it's they're all one of a kind. It's not the normal kind of casting for jewelry. Um, and so to have <laughs> adults or kids come up and ask me what I'm doing or how that's made and being able to explain and actually show them, I think is a lot of fun for me. Because uh, they're like, oh, I didn't know you could do it like that, or oh, that's how that's made. So that's that's really cool for me. A typical day is there's a lot of repetitive processes I do. So uh, I could be doing some casting, and while I'm waiting for my furnace to heat up, I'm carving over here uh, multiple pieces, and then I'm stamping and I'm soldering. So. There's a lot of little things that uh, I can get to one point and then I have to wait and so I'll move on to the next portion of it. So I'm always in here making noise <laughs> or making things smell a little weird. So I get a lot of customers coming in being like, oh, you're the one making that noise. I'm like, you found me. Having the Torpedo Factory be metro accessible has uh, actually helps, especially when I have friends, you know, who use the metro coming to see my stuff. Uh, or other patrons um, and just bringing new people you know from the city over here because I'm like oh yeah you can get right off King Street Metro hop on the free trolley and come right down or if it's nice you can walk so I've had a lot of visitors and people come in that way which has been really awesome. A uh, piece of advice I would give to young artists would be to make sure you document your process and your progress of things and not being afraid to put yourself out there, be it a jury competition or a critique. I think it's really important to learn those processes and also I would suggest taking a business class because <laughs> there's a lot of business that goes into it and I was very fortunate to have really great mentors who are experienced with that portion of it uh, because it's important to make your art but it's also important to be able to um, showcase that you are a business and a professional as well. So I do have a website. You can go to www.udopjewelry.com. You can find me on Instagram at udopjewelry. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at udop for Whitney. Uh, I'm all over the place. Mm -hmm. I am Matthew Johnston. I'm an artist here at the Torpedo Factory in Alexandria. I moved into the Torpedo Factory in 1978. When I saw the Torpedo Factory first, I knew it was a gold mine for me because I could work around the gallery system. And I think the gallery system today is in stress because of the internet. I can sell directly to the public. And I think the public has learned a lot more about art in the last 30 or 40 years. They're not so timid about buying a piece of art from the artist directly. They don't need to basically the imperture or maybe of the uh, gallery stamp on it to make a decision, I think. I love interacting with people. People from all over the world come here. They like art and they ask me questions. They inspire me, actually. Sometimes it change my work. I think you'd have to augment your income somehow to have a studio to yourself. I mean, I, I had another job for years and basically worked here at the same time. I love my space. It gives me a place to work, to show, to sell, and I have fell in love with the town. It's ease of living, the beauty. A lot of people come to visit me here in Alexandria and they just can't believe how beautiful it is and how well kept. Metro is very important to me. Now, I bought my house up by the King Street station simply for that reason. I wanted to be close to the Metro stop and I'm only a block from the stop. So I think it's great for, especially the younger generation, that are basically, cars are not, a, not that important to them. A lot of them just don't have cars, so the, the metro is very important for them. I think having an art studio close to the metro is a big boon to me. I think you can see other art centers further out that don't have metro access, and that'd be tough for me to make a living there. Inspiration for me comes from just watching. I mean, it could be uh, the river in the morning, the color, it could be a couple sitting at lunch outside. Every little thing, really, everything you see during the day, I think is inspirational. 
for me. I mean, I try to reinvent. I mean, I may use images that people see every day, but I like to reinvent them so they look at them differently. You know, in my figurative pieces, I have them split in half so they have their own physical space, but they're also cropped at the head so that people don't focus on who it is. They search for information in other places when they look at the piece. Yeah, they're, they're, it makes it more ambiguous. I like to hear people stand in front of them and, and speak about them. And lots of times they don't realize it, but they're speaking about themselves, which is very fun to listen to. I am standing on the grounds of the Carlisle House with Vanessa Herndon. She works here. Thank you so much for having us. Tell us a little bit about the history of this building. It was the home of English merchant John Carlisle. Uh, he moved here in the 1750s and he built this house from the ground up. And he came over here basically to make a name for himself, own several businesses, and he's also one of the town founders of Alexandria. Give us a little bit of history about the house, how he created the house. Did he build the house? Um, he did not build the house. Um, the house was built using slave labor and basically a stone house in Alexandria was not the norm. If you walk around Old Town you see a lot of brick or wood buildings but we think he built a house of stone because it reminded him of living back in England and he wanted to have everyone around know that he was an Englishman. One thing you wouldn't know unless you come and visit us is that we actually have a cat skeleton in our wall. And the poor cat. <laughs> We believe that the cat was placed there. Um, it was kind of a good luck to keep away death from the house. The cat was already dead before he was placed in the wall. Um, so when people that makes visit, feel better about it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so when people visit, we always point out the wall where the cat is, and he's still protecting the house today. Most of our tours are walk-ins. We only ask for reservations for groups ten of more. Our hours are ten to four Tuesday through Saturday, and twelve to four on Sunday. What a lot of people don't know is we actually have a Civil War history. And where we're standing now is the location of the Mansion House Hotel. So you can see that the ghost marks here of the building that used to stand here. And that hotel, later a Civil War hospital, is the subject of the PBS series, Mercy Street. So if you first walk in to get a tour of Carlisle House, you enter what would be the lowest level of the house, the basement level. And that's where our gift shop is. And we have a small exhibit space and an area that has an introductory video. And then the next level is the main level of the house, and that's where the parlor is, the dining room, John Carlisle's personal study. And then the next floor of the house would have been where the children and guests would have slept. But right now, that's an exhibit. And then we also have an attic as well. So it's a four-level house. Four-level house. Um, John Carlisle originally did not have a garden there, but that is something that um, Nova Parks put in. So there's a nice green space in this urban area for people to escape to. So obviously we're in a historic, monumental place here. Tell us what it's like to have the upkeep. I'm sure it's a lot of work taking care of this beautiful mansion. It is. The home has been here for over 200 years, and so we have to not only upkeep it, but we have to keep the historical integrity. So there are some technological advances we can't have in the house because it would not have been there in the 18th century. But most guests love to see how well intact the house is, and they feel like they're stepping back in history when they come and visit us. So we're in Old Town Alexandria, and of course we have King Street Station, all the metro buses that run here. What does the proximity of being metro accessible mean for the Carlisle House? It's great because many people are in town, and they're, of course, going to D.C. and going to the monuments. But what's great about being in Old Town Alexandria is that we do have the metro stop. And the other great thing about Alexandria is at the metro station, there's a free trolley that people can take. And uh, there's a stop right here on Market Square, so we're just a short walk from the trolley stop. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa, for having us. And again, if everyone can step into the Carlisle House, you'll get to see the historic value that it has here in Old Town Alexandria. So thank you again for having us.
Standing and Stitch Sew Shop with the owner, Callie Thompson. Thank you, Callie, for having us. Thank you for coming. Tell us all about Stitch. What's the history? How'd you get started? Stitch is a sewing workspace and a fabric shop. We focus on garment sewing as opposed to other types of fabric stores that you might have been to before. We have classes, workshops, and lessons, individual lessons, and you may also use the workspace for a project of your choosing by the hour. I've always been a maker of one kind or another, and I got into sewing clothing when my oldest was a baby and made clothes for her, and then she got a little bit older, had an opinion, and didn't want to wear what I made anymore, and so I started making clothes for myself. And um, I just wanted to be able to sort of find and establish a community for people that had similar interests and be able to share the fun and um, satisfaction that comes with making your own clothes. What made you choose the Old Town Alexandria area? I live in Old Town and I love it. Um, we've been here about three years. We moved from Georgia and we were in the suburbs, very different lifestyle. <laughs> And um, I just love the walkability, and I like the unique, the boutiques, and how everything is different than you find, you know, um, other places. So I thought it was a good fit. And of course, you're so close to the proximity of the King Street Metro Station. Mm -hmm. You have the buses that run all through the area. Right. So I'm sure that makes a difference. How does that impact Stitch? Oh, it's great. I mean, a lot of people do comment that they're so glad that we're available, you know, on the Metro or the bus. Um, I have employees that take the public transit into work and um, the free trolley that goes up and down King Street is great um, for people to be able to get around and discover Old Town a little bit and make it in. Our patterns are all from independent pattern designers, which um, is important to me because they are largely female-owned small businesses and I think that that's nice to support. Frequently with the independent pattern designers, first of all, their companies are small, so they're lighter weight and they're able to sort of follow the trends a little bit more quickly than some of the larger pattern companies. And they provide a lot of secondary support in addition to having very detailed instructions with the pattern. As far as fabrics, we have sort of a little bit of everything from everywhere, whatever tickles my fancy. <laughs> On about a monthly basis, I bring in what I'm calling a celebrity, which is anyone from a pattern designer to a well-known sewing blogger, someone that um, is pretty well-known in the industry, and we make a special something for the weekend. It's a fun getaway, it's all weekend long. We start Friday evening with the, like a cocktail party kickoff, meet and greet, and then sew all day Saturday and all day Sunday. So it's a really nice opportunity to sort of immerse yourself in your craft and get to meet some people that have similar interests as well as getting to know you know, someone that you might have admired online for a while. And I know you were sharing with me that you have a workshop coming up in August. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, I'm really excited about this one. It's um, from a pattern designer for Blueprints Patterns. Her name's Taylor McVeigh. And um, we're gonna be making a skirt based on a pattern that she has made. And she's going to um, use some inspiration from Old Town to provide us with a custom exclusive pack of embroidery um, patterns that we can embellish the garment with. So I'm looking forward to that, it should be a lot of fun. I'm really excited about the response so far from the community and I'm looking forward to becoming a place that people can um, come and either learn or further their skills. I'm excited about the opportunity to collaborate with other makers in the industry, the pattern designers. Everyone that comes to the door has a different skill set and a different experience level. So we offer everything from what we call a primer, machine sewing a primer, which is for someone that has never touched a sewing machine before, but wants to learn. And we go over just the basic anatomy of a sewing machine, basic functions, and make a small project. And that's a really good um, introduction to someone to see if, if it's for them, if they want to pursue, you know, um, sewing. So what Kylie has on custom pieces today that you made, I do, I do. are you gonna be able to sell some of your products maybe eventually? What do you think about for yourself? No, I am not interested in sewing for anyone else. Um, I will happily teach you to sew for yourself, but I will not sew for you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for having Metro Focus, and I hope our viewers get to come and visit your beautiful shop here. Thank you for coming in. No problem. My name is David Umancy and I'm one of the co-owners of Casa Rosada Artisan Gelato. We've been open since June 2014. We just had our two-year anniversary in June. 
Casa Rosada means pink house in Spanish, which was inspired by the Argentine presidential palace. We chose this name because the outside of our facility is pink and my family comes from Argentina, so the play on words with Casa Rosada uh, came to fruition in that sense. My father, who is originally a chemical engineer by trade, had been practicing making gelato with my mother Raquel uh, in their home for many, many years until we decided to open up our business in June 2014. All the desserts we provide are produced in-house using all natural ingredients and the style of gelato that we were mimicking is what you would typically find in Argentina. We provide classic flavors like chocolate, vanilla and pistachio uh, to more unique flavors that you would only find in Argentina like marron glacé which is a chestnut and anise gelato and crema rusa which is a walnut and port wine gelato. We also provide uh, dairy-free options like sorbets from a wide variety of fruits and also a sorbet solely made with soy milk, which is our soy vanilla. Argentina has a very heavy Italian influence, which is the root of why gelato is so popular in Argentina as well. There are many similarities between Italian gelato and Argentine gelato. The terminology of flavors might differ, where in Italy you'll have stracciatella, and in Argentina you'll have granizado, which is our chocolate chip equivalent. I think what differentiates us from the rest of the DC metro area with regards to gelato and ice cream in general is that we are a strictly family owned and operated business. At all times, we'll, they'll always be a member of our family here. We produce everything on site, so the customer is getting the freshest product possible because it's going from our kitchen and then we walk it right over to the display where it's being served. Our business would be very different without Metro. Most of our customer base is not from the city of Alexandria and we would rely on Metro to bring in these customers from outside of the city so they can come by and enjoy our product. Given that we're closer to the Metro instead of the water is also fundamental to picking up customers that are off King Street as they walk towards the water so they would find our business when they normally wouldn't. We'd been looking for a location with a natural sense of foot traffic. This whole area is really great because of the residents who live in the area surrounding our business. We love the fact that they can come in and have a casual conversation with us and that we have more than just a business owner patron interaction. We're getting to know more about them as people and they get to know more about us. For the first time, Safe Track will impact one of the busiest lines we have in the system. Our red line riders will be impacted by the year-long safety maintenance plan. Beginning August 1st to the 7th, only one of the two tracks in the red line will be open for train traffic between Tacoma and Silver Spring. Those traveling in that area should expect longer wait times on the platforms. Riders at the other end of the red line will be affected from August 9th through the 18th, when there will be non-stop single tracking from Shady Grove to Twinbrook. That means if you catch a train at Shady Grove or Rockville, you could wait up to 18 minutes instead of the usual six minutes during rush hour. You may want to enter the system at Twinbrook or another station to the east to avoid those delays. Toward the end of the month, from August 20th through September 5th, blue and yellow line riders will have longer than normal wait times at the end of the line. Trains will single track continuously between Franconia Springfield and Van Dorn Street. If you usually use Franconia Springfield, you should make alternate plans. Trains there will only service the platform every 24 minutes. Rush Plus service on the yellow line to Franconia Springfield will be suspended during the safety surge. There are no planned station closures in August. And remember, Metro Bus is a great way to get wherever you need to go in the region during this maintenance period. Visit wmata.com slash safe track for more information. Thank you for your continued patience as we work on rebuilding and restoring the Metro Rail system. Cirque du Soleil is in Washington with a world of curiosities. Where reality is relative. And 
seeing is disbelieving. Curios, Captain of Curiosities from Cirque du Soleil. Presented by Visa Signature with United Mallage Plus. Now playing through September 18th at Tyson's 2. Tickets at Cirque du Soleil.com. CAS is Collective Action for Safe Spaces. Uh, we're an organization that is volunteer-led and run, and we advocate for a safer DC community that is free from public sexual harassment and assault. CAS has been in operation since 2009. We started it off as a blog where people could come and share their harassment stories and just have it be part of a blog that we had online. Um, and it evolved into an organization where we, we developed into an advocacy organization that advocates for safe spaces and has uh, workshop trainings and engages the community on being a safer public space. We focus mainly on the DC metro area. Um, there are many different organizations across the country who do the same thing for their own respective city. Uh, CAS really just serves the DC metro area, although we hope to uh, have data collection that can serve more cities. When you're trying to get from point A to point B, you probably consider a couple of things. So you probably think, okay, uh, what's the convenience of this method of transportation and how much is it going to cost? Well, many people consider safety as well because it's not always as simple as just getting from point A to point B. You have to consider, is it safe enough for me to travel? Am I gonna feel comfortable on this method of transportation? So that's really what you have to consider when you're, when you're at risk of being harassed. We've been in partnership with WMATA since 2012, and we've had a really aggressive campaign against harassment and assault on the Metro. We started out with Metro ads, and we followed up with frontline training for Metro station managers and Metro staff on how to recognize and respond to street harassment and assault on, on, tra on transit. You can be the advocate for a victim. Um, harassment typically happens pretty quickly, and when you're on a rush hour train or a busy train like the red line or the blue and orange lines, it's difficult to um, pay attention to actions that are happening, but you can, you can recognize by the expressions and body language of a person you believe may be being victimized, and you can respond by asking the person who's being uh, affected if they're okay, if you can help them, if, you, you know, this, if this is unwanted attention. You can also intervene if you feel safe doing so. For example, if, you, if someone is being harassed and they are very clearly expressing through their body language or verbally that they're being harassed, you can tell the harasser to stop, to leave them alone, or otherwise just be a physical barrier in between the harasser and the victim. Intervening is a really important step and it, it helps the, empower the victim and helps uh, de-escalate the situation. A national survey on street harassment done by Stop Street Harassment showed that 65% uh, of women and 25% of men have experienced street harassment in some form. Now we don't have any data to compare that to locally, although we're really hoping through, through working with DC City Council and other in the mayor's office to collect some data. But the only other uh, data that we have is through our Metro survey, which was the first of its kind in the nation. So you can visit our website at collectiveactiondc.org. You can follow us on Facebook, Collective Action for Safe Spaces, or you can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at SafeSpacesDC. So we really encourage that you share your harassment story on our website through our blog. Uh, thousands of people already have, and it really helps us uh, understand what a problem with harassment is and where it's occurring in DC. To share your story on our blog, go to bit.ly slash castblog. And to support us by giving us a donation, which we'd really appreciate, go to bit.ly slash supportcast. Welcome back, hope you enjoyed the ride and learned all about Old Town Historic Alexandria, Virginia. Until the next time we meet Metro Focus viewers, take care. <laughs>